Well, thank you so much for uh, the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I hope that you can all hear me well. I'm happy to be part of this, uh, this class here today. Uh, it was, uh, this is obviously the second in a series. I think that the class last week or two weeks ago with Fred Haight about Beethoven as an American revolutionary uh, was a lot of fun. The discussion was fantastic and I look forward to a similar discussion here today. Um, let me just say by way of opening that we are obviously, it goes without saying, living during completely unprecedented times, including when it comes to music, live musical performance. The world over, literally, uh, music has ceased to play as a live phenomenon. I don't think this has ever happened before in the history of mankind, uh, even during great wars and conflicts, concerts have gone on. I don't think there's ever been a time like this when it's completely undefined, when live musical performance will, will resume. But, um, you know, we do obviously seek to approximate these experiences in a digital form. Uh, we've had some online, uh, musical presentations among this group and also orchestras and opera companies around the world are doing that kind of thing. But uh, by no means is that, does that measure up. It absolutely pales in comparison to being present in a shared space at a defined moment of, uh, of space time, sharing in the act of musical creation, both the performers and the audience members alike. You could call this almost, I guess an appropriate term would be, a grand pause in the entire musical life of the planet, or a grand global caesura, I guess would be appropriate. But it really, in a certain way, may be a, or may come, or we may turn it into a blessing in disguise. Uh, because I think it has afforded us the space to recalibrate our sense of the absolute critical, uh, irreplaceable value of live musical performance of great music. And uh, if we do our job right, I think, especially with this discussion series, with the Misa Solemnis project and engaging like-minded people around the world, I think when we are finally given the opportunity to return to the stage and to engage in live musical performance once again, I think we can burst back onto the scene with a renewed commitment to the true value and the goals of what musical performance actually should be. And there will by all means be a thirst for great music, great art, for great culture. Um, and I think we're in the position to usher in a long, long overdue renaissance in music and in culture with a sense of urgency like mankind has never seen before. Um, that's really what this class series, I believe, is seeking to achieve, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be a part of that endeavor. So let me just say, by way of introduction, um, let me test my screen sharing ability. How does that look? Is it a thumbs up? Okay. So by way of introduction, the subject of our discussion here today, I think perhaps can come under many headings, but I chose this, Shadow versus Substance, uh, the genius of Wilhelm Furtwängler. Uh, what we're gonna be doing today, and by no means are we going to explore everything, but I hope we just scratch the surface and inspire some, some, some ideas. But what we're gonna do is look at the philosophy of music, or you could say the science of music, or probably much more appropriately, more specifically, the science of the human mind uh, through the eyes of one of the greatest conductors of the 20th century. His name was Wilhelm Furtwängler, and you see him pictured here. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this man, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to introduce you to him. Uh, and for those of you who might be familiar with his work to one degree or another, I do hope to help you get to know him a little bit better and perhaps to appreciate him on a deeper and more profound way. And even perhaps to open the door ever so slightly to being able to emulate what Furtwängler was able to accomplish. Um, 
I don't want to go too much into a biography uh, of Furt Wengler. What I will say just in brief, just to introduce you to him ever so slightly, um, here's a picture of his father. His father was named Adolf Furt Wengler, and he was actually a world-renowned archaeologist. His expertise was in ancient Greece in, and ancient Rome. And he traveled to the area, um, and he eventually became the director of the famous Glyptotec. This is the Museum of, of Classical Sculpture, Greek and Roman, and also Egyptian sculpture, which is in Munich, Germany. Maybe some people who have had the opportunity to travel to Germany have visited this museum, and it's an absolutely incomparable experience to see this, uh, these sculptures of the ancient world. Uh, this position that his father held is what brought Wilhelm Furtwängler, obviously, as a boy, as the son of his father, to Munich, Germany, uh, a center of culture in Germany. And growing up in the late 19th century, he began studying counterpoint and composition. He actually originally intended to be a composer. That was his career path that he had in mind. And he studied with this fellow. His name is Joseph Reinberger. He was a composer, an organist. Um, Reinberger, I believe, is a very undervalued composer today. Some people who are church musicians are familiar with his uh, organ works or his choral works. He wrote symphonies, he wrote sonatas, he wrote all kinds of things, but he was an adherent, a strict adherent, at the time where this was actually in question, to the Bach, Beethoven, Brahms tradition in German classical music. And he taught counterpoint. Uh, he taught counterpoint and composition according to uh, a method which was not teaching the rules. He did not do it by way of giving a set of rules that you were supposed to follow. What he would do is he would give his students a copy of Beethoven's late string quartets, and he would tell them, okay, now go home and study this and learn your counterpoint from Beethoven. And that's exactly what he did with Wilhelm Furtwängler. Furtwängler was well known to have, when he was a young boy, to be walking around with his nose in a miniature score of Beethoven's late string quartets. And at a certain point, he actually was um, famous for having the ability to sit down and play from memory, note perfect, every single note of a uh, late Beethoven string quartet from memory at the piano. Um, so this is a good teacher. Uh, Reinberger had many students, incidentally, one of his other students, in addition to Furt Wengler, was none other than Max Planck, the great theoretical physicist and scientist who was a contemporary of Furt Wengler, and, as you can see, was also a musician in his own right. Now, um, Wilhelm Furt Wengler's conducting career spanned 48 years. His conducting debut, and this is a picture of him at the age of 20, his conducting debut was on February 19th, 1906, at uh, one of the orchestras, prominent orchestras in Munich, what eventually became the Munich Philharmonic. It was called the Orchestra Keim of Music, organized by a fellow named Keim. Uh, Furt Wengler gave his conducting debut. The concert consisted of uh, Beethoven, Consecration of the House Overture, Furt Wengler conducting one of his own compositions, a symphonic poem in B minor, and then also the Symphony No. 9 by Bruckner. And then, 48 years later, his conducting uh, career ended with his final concert on September 20th, 1954, with his orchestra, the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, at which he also conducted, look at that, Beethoven, and Furt Wengler. He conducted Furt Wengler's Symphony No. 2 and Beethoven's Symphony No. 1. So, incidentally, I think that those two concerts taken as the bookends of his career should probably tell us what he viewed himself as. 
that in fact he did see himself primarily as a composer throughout his entire life and also a conductor in addition to that. Um, but he was always seeking in every single performance that he did, and he was explicit about this, to recreate the music in that moment as if it was being composed spontaneously at that very moment in time, uh, in that instant, being brought forth for the very first time as an active, living process of, of creativity in that moment, never a static presentation of some dead object, some, some notes from a page in a dusty book somewhere that had been performed countless times before and was already perfected and everybody knew how it went. He shocked you every single time, whether it was a work that you had never heard before, had just been composed, or if it was a work that you might have thought you knew, but he shocked you and said, no, you didn't know this. There was something even deeper in this piece. And you hear this in his recorded performances. No two recordings of the same piece were ever the same. So following his uh, final concert, which was not intended to be his final concert, he actually had a whole season planned ahead of it. He was going to Vienna. He was actually supposed to come to the United States and do a tour the next spring. But after that concert on September 20th, 1954, he became ill while traveling and ended up uh, being hospitalized. And then less than two months later, he, was, um, he died at the age of 68, end of November, 1954. So here is a picture of Furt Wengler's grave. This is in Heidelberg, Germany. And you can see the words, Wilhelm Furtwängler, January 25th. I know a couple of other people who are tuned into this broadcast who share that birthday. January 25th, 1886, and November 30th, when he died, 1954. And then these are the words that he chose to be inscribed on his gravestone. Nun aber bleibt Glaube, Hoffnung, Liebe. Diese drei. Aber die Liebe ist die größte unter ihnen, which means in English, and now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And these are, of course, the words of St. Paul from Corinthians 13, but they are also the concluding words of Johannes Brahms's song cycle, Die Vier Ernste Gesänge, the four serious songs. And this piece played a very prominent role in Furt Wengler's life. In fact, um, he chose to perform the four serious songs, Die Vier Ernste Gesänge, at a memorial concert, which he conducted for his mentor and his predecessor at the Berlin Philharmonic. Here he is, Arthur Nickisch. Arthur Nickisch was the conductor of the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra and also the Berlin Philharmonic. And when Arthur Nickisch died in 1920, I believe, maybe it was 22, uh, so surprising, uh, surprisingly, uh, he was not expected to die, he passed away very suddenly, uh, Furt Wengler immediately came in and became the, the conductor of the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra. Uh, which Mendelssohn had been the conductor of previously and several others. And then uh, within a few days also took over the directorship of the Berlin Philharmonic. And he held that position through the rest of his career. Um, but at this memorial concert that Furt Wengler organized for Arthur Nickisch, he performed as the accompanist. He was on the piano accompanying a baritone of that time named Ratz Brockmann, who sang the Brahms Four Serious Songs, which end with those words from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Furt Wengler also conducted the funeral march from the Eroica Symphony, Beethoven's Symphony No. 3, in honor of Nikish at that concert. And at the same concert, I just found this out, another piece by Brahms was also conducted, not by Furt Wengler, but by the director of the, of the choir there. And that was Brahms's choral piece called Nania, or the Song of Lamentation. And I think that some of you who 
um, are, are watching this here today might be familiar with that piece and might have even participated in singing in the performance of that piece last year at, at Carnegie Hall in New York City. And obviously this piece is a setting of a poem by Friedrich Schiller, the namesake of this, uh, the Schiller Institute. And the piece begins with the words, Auch das Schöne muss sterben. Also, even the beautiful must die. But it really is a similar idea in content to the Brahms Four Serious Songs. Our life might be finite. Our, our bodies might be mortal. Even the most beautiful might die. But that which is immortal is love. And the Nania ends with that same idea. So in total, uh, Furt Wengler conducted over 3,200 live concerts in his career in 48 years and um, has left us with a treasure trove of, of recordings, which are absolutely invaluable for us today. And they really set the gold standard for what musical performance should be and really what we as musicians should seek to achieve. But for those of us who hold ourselves to that challenge, and it's a challenge, uh, what we're compelled to do is ask the question, what was Furt Wengler's secret? It's not just a style. It's not just his way, his sound, or something like that. There was, what was, what is it about Furt Wengler's approach to music, which set him apart from practically any other conductor of that time, and definitely let alone any conductor today? So to answer that question, luckily, we have, um, all the recordings to study, but also Furt Wengler, because I think he knew how crucial it was to save what he understood about great music. He was unusually articulate about his ideas concerning music and what the, his goals were in the pursuit of, of, of art, of his art. Um, these are primarily in the form of essays that he published, and also we have some very interesting fragments that can be found in some of his private notebooks. Um, here's a book, this is in German, Wilhelm Furtwängler, Ton und Wort. Um, here's a book which contains just some fragments from his notebooks, which he's just writing ideas down and sort of trying to work with ideas. Um, I also should show you this as a composer. These are Lieder composed by Wilhelm Furtwängler. They're pretty early, actually. Many of them are dated um, from the 18, 1880s, mid to late 1880s. And one of them even says the dedication is Komponiert uh, 1869 der lieben Mami zu Weihnachten gewindet, which means dedicated to my beloved mother on Christmas. <laughs> His mother was a painter. So, he, he, he left us a lot, um, relatively, of, of written material and notebooks and essays. And um, I think that he's looking to try to put into words, which is, to be honest, an impossibility, but is a worthwhile task. Uh, what is it that he understood about the science of music but what I think we're going to discover is that this is really the science of the human mind. And writing or speaking about music is, is admittedly very difficult to do. But on the other hand, especially when we are so far removed from the level of culture, the cultural milieu that these great um, conductors, a conductor such as Furt Wengler or the exquisite musicians that he worked with, uh, without which he would really not have been able to accomplish anything, but where these, these musicians came from, what produced this generation of musicians. Uh, when we are so far removed from that, I think it's invaluable to have access to not only Furt Wengler's recorded music, but also to his words. So when we are asked to speak about music, a task which I admit I'm always somewhat reluctant or hesitant to do since speaking about music by definition can come nowhere near the effect of actual musical performance. But when we must do so, I would assert we must challenge ourselves to speak about music, both 
as scientists and as poets simultaneously because it's in fact there's no distinction between the two and it's in this realm which is where music the intersection between these poetry and science this is where we find this is where we find music uh, because the true subject of music is nothing but the science of the human mind and the poetry of how one mind may communicate great ideas to the mind of another so just to assert some things first of all we have to realize that music is not sound it's very paradoxical of course music is sound but music is not sound or said, said another way the true subject of music is not the sounds that we hear it's not the notes it's not the instruments it's not the voices it's not the theory the harmony the form everything that you learn as a music major or a graduate degree all of those are obviously essential but why is uh why f without these things obviously music it's it's indispensable music would not exist but they're merely the medium it's merely a vehicle it's the true subject of music is us reflecting on the power of our own creative minds it's the science of the human mind and the poetry of the human soul that's the subject of music and all the elements that i listed out the notes the voices the instruments all of these that we hear these are merely the shadows they're casting our, themselves on on the screen the projection screen of of our senses and when we what we see what we hear but they are merely shadows they that's all they are and we never want to get stuck in in the prison within the prison walls of these five senses the universe is so much more interesting than just these little spectrum of phenomenon that we can that we can experience with our senses so the task is to escape the prison escape that prison of the senses and to discover what it is that lies beyond those senses so what we're going to discuss here today i'm going to attempt to discuss it is the difference between the shadows and the substance and demonstrate that this experience of our senses sense perception is merely a shadow land it's a pale reflection of a much higher reality which is casting those shadows and that's what we have to tune into um, the famous allegory that's told by plato in his republic the allegory of the cave is a perfect illusion to reference in this regard. So in true musical performance, if the, if the music is not the notes, what that means is that the notes themselves must never be the subject. The notes must never call attention to themselves per se. In fact, the notes must always, the, the, the job of the notes is always to point away from themselves to redirect us from what we're hearing and to direct us towards something that's unheard something that's lurking above the notes or behind the notes or between the notes as it's been said um between it's really the it's the ironical juxtaposition of these notes or more so between the voices or the phrases or you could call it the musical motifs it's the ironical juxtaposition between these which reveals the true subject of the music it's the process of change it's the dramatic interaction of these characters the dramatic interaction on the stage of of the symphonic of the symphonic work this dramatic interaction between these developing musical motifs that we're hearing what that process of change is of of uh that process of development that's which reveals the unheard idea which is shaping every phrase it's shaping every every note every moment of the piece this is what the great um violinist norbert brynin he was the violinist of the amadeus string quartet this is what norbert brynin would refer to as motif theorem it's motivic thorough composition where each musical motif leads to another and it's through this process of development the ironical juxtaposition of these motifs that's where the idea can be found it's the cracks between it's the spaces between it's not in them themselves so when you follow this 
this creates this relentless unity of effect, this unbroken, seamless unity through the entirety of the piece. It's between the bookends, right? The two moments of silence. The moment of silence before the piece, the conductor's got his baton in the air, it's pregnant, it's full of potential, and then the moment of silence right after the cutoff, before the applause erupts, that when, when, when the entirety of the piece, the totality of what you just experienced is echoing, it's collapsed within that one moment, that one moment of silence at the end. It's what comes between those two. That's, that's where we find this, this, this unity. So at the end of the piece, every moment of what we as the audience just experienced, it was ephemeral, it's gone. It was here and then it's gone. So if it's, if it's an experience, then the piece has no more meaning than that moment that we, that we experienced the, the note. Uh, that, that's just momentary. But something ephemeral cannot have, cannot possess meaning in and of itself. So we have to look, there's something not momentary. If there's gonna be something that's not ephemeral, it's something that's not momentary, it's something that's eternal. It's something which is beyond this, this succession of moments. It's beyond time. Something which lives outside of the, that temporal succession of experiences, beyond each moment, beyond each individual moment of time, which is shaping what we're experiencing, but it can never be experienced in and of itself. It's almost like this ghostly presence, which we know is there. It's, we know it exists but it's intangible. We can't reach out and grab it. It's not something that we can touch. And so we receive an intimation of that reality in the shadows which that reality casts, right? As the apostle Paul famously said in that same letter to the Corinthians, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then we see face to face. Uh, and I hope what I've just asserted will become more clear as this discussion unfolds. So now, what I'd wanted to do by way of pedagogy was to play a fairly rare video segment from a rehearsal which was conducted by Wilhelm Furtwängler to give you the experience of actually sitting in an orchestra rehearsal under the baton of the great Wilhelm Furtwängler himself. Um, it was a clip of him rehearsing the beginning portion of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, the Eighth Symphony, um, with his orchestra, the Berlin Philharmonic. Unfortunately, I cannot play that. Uh, I can't play the video during this stream due to copyright restriction. Um, but I, I will make the, the link available. Maybe we can put it in the description so you can watch it afterwards. But what you will immediately recognize when you, when you watch this is that there is something about Furtwängler Furtwängler's conducting, which is his technique, his presence, what he's projecting, which is completely alien to anything which you would experience by any living conductor today. There are great conductors living today, but, but there's nothing, nobody who achieves what, what Furtwängler achieves. So um, instead of playing that clip, um, let me read a few comments that have been made by Furtwängler, by other conductors, other musicians, and other, other, other individuals, which I think hopefully will bring to life at least some of the effect that you would get from actually watching him or sitting in with him as he rehearses. So let me start here. This is um, not by any order of preference, but this is, uh, is Claudio Abato. He was a renowned conductor reflecting on his experience as a musician. He was a young musician in rehearsals in the orchestra under the baton of Furtwängler. And I think these words will resonate with you if you see that clip that I was talking about from the Unfinished Symphony. This is what Abato said. Even when Furtwängler walked into the pit, there was a tension around him, like electricity. In the rehearsals, he would go over certain parts again and again, patiently explaining what he wanted. And slowly, this wonderful, warm sound came out of the orchestra. And the tension, always this wonderful tension from beginning to end. He was one of the few musicians who could create tension even in the pauses when there was nothing but silence. 
that continuity, that flow was something I will never forget. Those rehearsals and the performances were something very special to me. So those are, those are wonderful words. His description, this wonderful tension from beginning to end. Furt Wengler was one of the few conductors who could create tension even in the pauses when there was nothing but silence. That I think really goes right to the point. It conjures the idea of John Keats in the Ode to a Grecian Urn. Heard melodies are sweet, but unheard melodies are sweeter. Another great uh, admirer of Furtwängler is the great Russian conductor Valery Gergiev, who currently serves as the artistic director of the Marinsky Theater in St. Petersburg. This thing that's on the screen, I'm sorry that it's so blurry, but I just wanted to show you in 2009, uh, Valery Gergiev organized an exhibition in St. Petersburg, in Russia, uh, which was titled here, you can see, Wilhelm Furtwängler, Maestro, Man, and Myth. And it's a whole ex ex exhibition, which went through his life, but also studied, um, you know, his, his performances, and it's a collection of all of this material regarding, regarding Furtwängler. And you can actually uh, you can hear on YouTube, if you speak Russian, you can hear uh, Valery Gergiev's opening remarks that he made at the exhibition hall, where he praises Furt Wengler. Um, so the year prior to this, this was organized in 2009. In 2008, Valery Gergiev gave an interview to WQXR in New York City, uh, where he was asked what conductor he admired the most. And his reply was, Furt Wengler. So he elaborated, this is what Gergiev says, the most difficult thing in conducting is not to slip into mechanical beating. So this restless search for a real tempo, a real pulse with, of practically each bar of music, rather than just one tempo for one movement, this is something which very few conductors could ever master. Not many conductors will confess, maybe, that it will be something difficult for them to do, but then they will go and compete with Furtwängler and most probably lose. Because it's a kind of God-given gift, a genius quality, which one conductor contributes to the playing of the orchestra. You can't possibly imagine this same orchestra play the way they play with Furtwängler if you just remove him from the podium. It was just not possible to imagine that they would do the same thing. They will even maybe be more organized. They'll be more focused in a certain ensemble, but they will never deliver this kind of incredible expression, which he is able to bring to life once being in front of an orchestra. And for those of you who have seen Gergiev conduct either live or in recording, you know that he also has his own very unique way of conducting. Um, undefined, less, uh, less, less crisp than what uh, you would normally expect. It's interesting to see that he aspires to, to what Furt Wengler was able to achieve. Um, here's one of my favorites. This is beautiful. This is a passage by Yehudi Menuhin. Um, and I should say, Yehudi Menuhin was a very courageous defender of Furt Wengler after the conclusion of World War II. Yehudi Menuhin, famous Jewish uh, violinist, soloist, who performed with Furt Wengler numerous times and who defended Furt Wengler vociferously after the war. Uh, this is what Yehudi Menuhin said. There are many conductors, but very few of them seem to reveal that secret chapel which lies at the very heart of all masterpieces. Beyond the notes, there are visions. And beyond those visions, there is this invisible and silent chapel where an inner music plays, the music of our soul whose echoes are but pale shadows. That was the genius of Furtwängler, because he approached every work like a pilgrim 
who strives to experience this state of being that reminds us of creation, a mystery which is at the heart of every cell. With his fluid hand movements so full of meaning, he took his orchestras and his soloists to this sacred place. And of course, Yehudi Menuhin was one of his soloists, so he speaks from experience. But this one really, I think, goes right to the point of some of what we're going to try to discuss today. So let me read one more passage. Actually, this is going to be two separate quotes, but from one more individual, from none other than Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, uh, economist and a passionate adherent to the art of Wilhelm Furtwängler. The first is from an article that he wrote in 1997 titled Behind the Notes. He speaks about returning from military service in Burma during World War II and finding a recording of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony, I believe, The Pathétique, conducted by Wilhelm Furtwängler. And this is what he says. It was the writer's first actual hearing of a Furtwängler performance. From the opening, the writer was, without exaggeration, virtually frozen in his seated position. The performance was stunning in its relentless suspension, its remarkable coherence from opening to close. Furt Wengler represented qualitatively better direction than the writer had ever heard before that moment in early 1946. Later, the writer learned of the phrase which Furt Wengler employed to describe his stunning advantage, performing between the notes. Since that first hearing of Furt Wengler's conducting, that experience has dominated this writer's relationship to music in the most compelling fashion and degree. And then the second passage is from a paper that Mr. Lyndon LaRouche wrote in 2003, titled Visualizing the Complex Domain. This picture, incidentally, is of him with Norbert Branin, who I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the lead violinist of the Amadeus Quartet and close personal friend of Lyndon LaRouche. He actually toured around the United States and Europe playing benefit concerts um, for uh, the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche, part of a whole grouping of great musicians who considered themselves his friend. But this quote reads as follows. In an effective staging of a classical tragedy or of a classical musical composition, the images on stage are superseded by a drama performed on the internal stage of the individual audience member's imagination. The comparison of the two stages, the shadows perceived and the imagined reality, involves contrasted human mental states, analogous to the contrast between sensory perception and the recognition of the unseen universal principle governing the movements of that which is perceived. Every successful classical performer, dramatic or musical, is implicitly aware of this and is governed by a prescience of such relationships. The task of the playwright or composer is to foresee the arrangement of the shadows represented by the seen and heard action on stage and to arrange those shadowy elements deployed in such an ironical fashion as to provoke the audience to search its own mind for the reality to which those shadows correspond. It is as if God arranged the visible motion of the solar system to cause Johannes Kepler's mind to recognize the reality of a universal principle of gravitation. So, the adequate performer of a classical musical composition crafts his or her performance to force the real intent of the composer upon the audience. The greatest conductor of the 20th century, Wilhelm Furtwängler, referred to this as performing between the notes. So I hope that um, 
these quotes from all of these different voices that we just heard have at least engaged your imagination a little bit, um, broadened your idea of what we're talking about when we talk about music. Um, in this class, what I want to do is let our main subject, Wilhelm Furtwängler, do much of the speaking for himself. But before I do that, I want to bring in one more voice for you to consider in order to frame the topic, uh, which we'll be hearing Furtwängler discuss in the writings that I'm about to share with you. That voice is that of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Leibniz was a great physicist, a philosopher, statesman. And this quote from Leibniz is taken from the very opening of an essay, which if you've never read it, I would really recommend reading the whole thing. But this is an essay titled On the Ultimate Origination of the Universe. He says, besides the world, that is, besides the aggregate of finite things, there is some dominant unity manifesting a much higher reason for the one which dominates the universe, not only rules the world, it also makes or creates it. It is superior to the world and so to speak beyond the world and is therefore the ultimate reason of things. Neither in any single thing, nor in the total aggregate or series of things can the sufficient reason for their existence be discovered. And Leibniz is asserting a general universal characteristic here. Um, since, he, since this is a general principle which he's discussing, allow me to just paraphrase Leibniz a little bit. I'm going to take that italic section and just put it in a slightly more specific context. So what if he said this? Neither in any single note, nor in the total aggregate and series of notes, can the sufficient reason for their existence be discovered. And I think that is the key to unlocking Furtwängler's secret. So, I think it's this challenge, what, what Leibniz poses here, um, it really gets, it's an ontological paradox, which traces itself all the way back to Plato, probably before, but definitely in Plato's famous dialogue with per, per Parmenides, the Parmenides dialogue, where he addresses the idea, the paradox of the one and the many. Um, really, what we're, what we're confronting is what is, what is real? What's shadow and what's substance? We always think that the things that we feel, the things that we experience, the things that we can touch, the things that we can hear, those are the things with, with solid existence. We, that's, that's real. And then the imagination, that's just, that's just air. That's just puff. That's just a cloud. That's not real. But really, if you address what's, what, what's being said here and what Furtfengler is going to say, the mind is actually more real ideas with no tangible tangible existence per se are more real than everything which we generally presume to be the concrete solid objects which we can touch feel smell hear and it turns our entire idea of the ontology of the universe upside down that that reason creativity ideas the mind is actually the fundamental reality and everything which we experience is a subordinate, is the shadow. The mind the, the, is the substance, the, the senses are the shadows. So it's, this is, it's nothing less than this, the one and the many. It's that, that, that Furtwängler is wrestling with and is fighting with himself to communicate throughout the course of his life, both in his music which speaks more loudly than his words, but also very, very, very clearly and definitively in his words. So what I'd like to do now is um, just read with you some excerpts from Furtwängler's essays and from his notebooks, which I'm not going to read the entirety of everything, but 
I just want to put together a few so that they can sort of start resonating with you. And I think that these selections will reveal, reveal that throughout his life, Furtwängler was constantly searching, searching for the images and for the metaphors and the, 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 the poetry to describe uh, that he could use to adequately put into words what he understood about classical art and what it reflects about the universe and about the human mind. So here are just a few excerpts that I want to share with you. Here he is. Let us consider the activity of artistic creation. When we look at this process, we find we can distinguish two levels. On the first, each individual element combines with those adjacent to it to form larger elements, these larger elements then combining with others, and so on. A logical out, outwards growth from the part to the whole. On the other level, the situation is the reverse. The given unity of the whole controls the behavior of the individual elements within it, down to the smallest detail. The essential thing to observe is that in any genu genuine work of art, these two levels complement each other, so that the one only becomes effective when put together with the other. The artistic process that has as its starting point the unity of the whole rests on the concept of a more or less complete vision of that whole. For the artist at work, this vision is the goal he seeks to attain, the star that unbeknownst to him guides his steps through the maze of obstacles and temptations that beset his path and show him how to unite the forces at his command. Only at the end of the journey, therefore, will the vision emerge in its totality. Not only for the listener, the receiver of the work of art, but also, and this is a vital point, for the composer, the creative artist himself, the total vision only achieves its full radiance when it merges with all the individual sources of light from within the work, the overall and the particular, interacting and stimulating each other. It is not that the vision is present, ready-made from the beginning, and is only waiting to be filled with artistic substance. On the contrary, the joy that the artist feels comes not from possessing the vision, but from the activity of turning it into reality. Up to the time of Beethoven, musical development had, been take, had taken place with the tacit assumption that the work of art emerged like an organism. Whereas Beethoven, following both his basic attitude to his material and the nature of his genius, sought to bring out the whole with ever greater clarity and power. His contemporaries, but even more, his successors in the Romantic movement, turned away from this approach. The concept of the work of art as an organic whole crumbled in their hands. The Romantics remained faithful to it only in small forms, and it was not long before the grand ideals of the past were forgotten altogether. Today, that concept has lost its central dominant position. No longer does it appear to be able to assert itself over the material. No longer is it the whole that controls the behavior of the parts. No longer does the vision go hand in hand with the forces contained in the material Rather, it is the latter which has come to dominate the vision, determining the form of the whole and thus the vision itself. The whole has been consumed 
by the parts, with the result that not only is there no longer a whole, but there are also no longer any parts, because these can only exist so long as there is a whole to which they can refer. This is an excerpt from another essay. The reproductive artist must first of all understand and perform the individual phrase as a whole, then the melody to which the phrase belongs, then the piece of which the melody is a part. If the demands of the individual part are in tune with the whole and the whole with the individual part, then everything is in balance. The prerequisite is that both the individual part and the whole should have passed through living emotion. There are some who can feel the individual phrase. Only a few who can feel the line of a longer melody, hardly anyone who can feel a true whole in its entirety, as the great masterpieces reveal. Here's another one. The most disastrous consequence of the lack of unified feeling is the constriction and limitation of the improvisatory element of playing in general. The smaller the independent and homogeneous part played by the individual musician, the more the conduct, con conductors intended agogic, dynamic nuances, etc., are either left out altogether or carried out in more or less mechanical ways, that is, through numerous rehearsals, through endless drilling. But the most important and the best thing, namely that imperceptible var variability of tempo and color can in no way be achieved mechanically by means of rehearsals. The higher level of technical correctness and control achieved does, no, does by no means make up for the lack of inspiration, but instead has the most disastrous consequences for the playing as a whole. Excessive technical control, that is, an evenly accomplished perfection in all the details of a piece, which are thus turned into something quite different from what their creators intended, that they should be a part of the whole, prevents the intellectual cohesion of these details into a whole. And the natural and productive way in which details are seen and interpreted via the whole is reversed. Okay, here's just a few more. Symphonic music involves the ful fulfillment of the moment within a larger process. Each individual thing has its own local function, and this within the development of the whole. The two meet and intersect at each moment. It is not always easy at first to grasp the fact that every detail has its function within the whole and is not only arranged within this whole, but often has an effect on the whole that goes far beyond its individual importance. Not always, but very often, the tiniest detail can disturb or even destroy the whole process. Anyone actually satisfied with the notes knows nothing of the secret of the great works. And finally, these two final excerpts, which I'd like to read, I think harken back to that which we started with when we read the inscription which Furtwängler chose for his own tombstone, that passage from St. Paul, which Brahms used as the conclusion of his four serious songs. Furtwängler says, corresponding to the power 
that works inwards from the whole to the parts, a power which proceeds from a more or less complete vision of the whole is an emotion which springs from the artist's relationship to the world at its most profound and most meaningful, an emotion one may call love. And then elsewhere he continues with that idea. Love. That love which is forever being seized and shaken by the work can never be replaced. Love alone creates the preconditions for the visionary and correct understanding of the whole in the work of art. For this whole, even if it is a great work whose effect is long lasting, is nothing but love. Each individual part can be more or less understood intellectually, but the whole can only ever be grasped by the living feeling of love. It is the only thing which is appropriate and fitting to the whole work of art as an image of the active and living world. Everything else, however skillful it may be, is limited and therefore profoundly boring to me. So I hope that these excerpts um, give you an idea of, first of all, an extraordinary intellectual, but an idea of what Furtwängler was preoccupied with throughout his entire life. Um, and I think it should at least have given a general concept of the question that confronts us as, as musicians. Um, before I open it up to, um, to discussion, um, I believe just taking what he said right there at the end, it's crucial for us to understand this if, we're, if we are to emulate what, what Furtwängler is challenging us towards. Because it's not merely enough to understand the, the paradox, um, the whole and the parts in, in abstract terms. Um, music is, a, it's an active, living, breathing, loving form of art. And the, the question is, how does one put this idea, this idea that we've been discussing, how do we put this into practice in the actual performance of a musical composition? Um, and I would assert also, I think embedded in this discussion is, are the seeds to, to bring about an entirely new scientific revolution and philosophical revolution in how we think about the universe um, and how we think about the mind. I mean, one of the things that is embedded in this whole discussion that we've been having is a very profound paradox when it comes to time. And I don't want to go into this in detail, but I do want to just, I want to, to tease you a little bit with it because all of our common notions of, of linear time and linear causality completely break down when we start thinking about the implications of what these statements that we've just read uh, must mean. I mean, when Furtwängler says the given unity of the whole must control the behavior of the parts in every individual moment down to the smallest detail. Well, when we talk about the parts being moments within temporal experience, then where does the unity, where does the unity of the whole exist? That's a, a, a new dimension of time, at least, I don't know, but this actually tells us that time itself is a shadow. Is there something outside of time? Is there something above time, which exists as the unity, which is, which is casting these shadows, which is shaping every moment in, within time? And if what Furtwängler is asserting is true, that the parts owe their existence to the whole, but that the whole cannot exist without the parts, that they too, they, 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 they depend on each other. They intersect with each other at every single moment of, of development, of, of, of becoming. Uh, then 
what does this tell us about the, about this living evolution of the parts, which is being shaped at all times as an echo or a shadow of this totality? Maybe it's the, the, the memory of the future, this future totality of the whole, which will be echoing in your ears once the piece is ended or, or something else. Um, how does this living, evolving, this dynamic, really, in the real term of that word, this dynamic, this dynamic relationship between these parts and the whole, how does that, how does that exist within time? How does this reciprocal interaction of the now and the, the eternal, how does that, how does that function? And how are we supposed to imagine that this temporal duration, which uh, cannot exist as a one within any moment of experience, how can we imagine that there is a one which is shaping that elsewhere? Um, in this way, this subject of musical creativity, um, I think it touches on a lot of the, the questions which were being explored in the end of the 19th and early 20th century when there was a nascent scientific revolution which Max Planck and Einstein were coming out of. Um, it, it touches on but it goes far beyond the, uh, the question of the so-called physical gestalts, which Wolfgang Kurler was exploring, among others. That's a subject for an entire other class altogether. But I think that um, even by at least posing these questions, we're beginning to see that this domain of musical space-time um, causes us to throw our customary notions of a simple linear idea of time and causality out the window and to begin to explore a new domain of musical space-time of, of re as revealed in music, but it's really the space-time of the mind. And it's, it's, it's crucial that it is because it's a space-time in which the primary acting principle is nothing less than creativity per se. That's what we mean by when we say music is, is nothing less than the science of the human mind. Um, so just to conclude, how does Furt Wengler express this dynamic relationship of the parts and the whole in practice, not just in the abstract? Um, there's a separate pedagogy which I would love to go through at some point where he actually takes you through the entire first movement of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. And from his standpoint, it's incredible. I don't have time to do that right now, um, but he also discusses it in the context of Bach. To him, Bach was the father and the pinnacle of all great Western classical music. Um, and he uses two terms, and these are important terms, I think. Fernhören and Nahören. These are German. Uh, fern means far, na means near. So you can think far-sighted and near-sighted. Most of us are one or the other, <laughs> um, but this is concerning music instead. Far hearing and near hearing, um, of course, in a metaphorical sense. Um, he also does discuss it in his writings as the being and the becoming, which comes directly out of Plato's dialogue on the Tima uh, Timaeus. But this constant evolving, this this relationship between the fernhören and the nahören, this uh, this intersection between the being and the becoming, that, that is the tension that you're feeling at the core of all of Furt Wengler's music, every performance by Furt Wengler. It's nothing less than that. And it's nothing that you can replicate just by trying to imitate the effect. You have to go right to where you have to go to the cause. So this is our, um, this is our conclusion here, and then I want to open it up for discussion. This is what Furt Wengler says about Bach. He elaborates that idea. He has the utmost, utmost respect uh, for, for Bach. Here he is. Bach remains today what he has always been, the divine creator on his throne above the clouds, beyond the reach of others. Here, we find concentration on the moment in time, united with the unheard expanse. The immediate realization of the part paired with the truly sovereign overall vision of the whole. 
with its ever-conscious feeling for the near and the far, at the same time, with its unconstrained fulfillment of the, the here and now, joined with the ever-present subconscious feeling for the structure, the flow of the whole, its near experience, na erleben, with its distance hearing, fernhören, box music is a greater example of biological certainty of purpose and natural power than we will ever find anywhere else in music. Bach, the creator of these choruses and these fugues, seems to be not a human being, but the spirit that rules the world. The very architect of the universe. It is this that makes him, for us, the greatest of all composers, the Homer of music, whose light still shines out across our musical firmament and whom, in a very special sense, we have never surpassed. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and I would love to open this up for some discussion. All right, thank you, Matt. That was really wonderful. A lot to think about. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Oh, okay. yes, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So yeah, please raise your hand if you have a question. You can click, oh, there's one, great. Go ahead, Diane. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks. First of all, that was delightful. Pleasure. Really love that Gergiev was such a fan of Furtwängler because I think it also kind of draws on this connection to Russia. I mean, the St. Petersburg Chorus where they performed the, the where they premiered the Missa Solemnis was an extraordinary chorus, and it just gives a hint of a certain legacy of tradition there, which I think is great. Um, on this question of hearing an unheard or uh, the interaction that's going on in the music, you know, there's another um, dimension of this, which are, uh, I don't know how to describe it, sounds that you don't hear at all, but nonetheless create a tension with the notes that are being played. For example, once it's in your mind that you're in a particular key, which I hate to think of as so fixed, but like a center of gravity, and then something is introduced which may or may not be dissonant in relation to the notes preceding or following it or even what it's being played against, but nonetheless your mind has such an orientation that you perceive it that way, which really, and I think in one of Lynn's papers he actually asserted it's not only the geometry of the key that you're in, but that Do major is somehow, you know, like in an eight key. So it's a relationship of whatever degree you are removed from Do major plus the transit. Anyway, it's quite an amazing thing to think of. And I guess when Megan or whoever is doing the, I hope we're having a class on Kepler and the scale, you know, the geometry of this harmony, it's a really fascinating thing that this exists already in the mind and is not something that's been imposed on us through experience or the sound per se. I don't know if you have more that you want to say about that, but it's... Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a, a really important point. Um, I mean, it is, I'm glad you, you brought it up as a, as a geometry. And it really, if, in fact, I mean, when we talk about the complex domain, right? This is a reference um, to to a geometrical understanding. Um, it was what what uh, Carl Gauss spoke about in the in his exploration of the fundamental theorem of algebra. But um, it is a, it's it's a much higher geometry, which is not one which is consistent of of uh, Euclidean or Cartesian space and and, and time. And, um, and just the geometry of music itself as something which, yes, resonates with the mind, and I'm glad you said this, but is also, it's not just, a, it's not just a, an artifact 
of the mind or of custom, which we've to we've been told a lot, but is really a, a universal principle. And it is, it's, it's a universal understanding of harmony. I mean, Megan will be, Megan Beats will be doing a presentation in a few weeks on Kepler and the harmonies of the world. But I think it's beautiful that, har that Kepler in his book, The Harmonies of the World, actually um, attributed the fact that he or the human mind itself was able to make the discoveries about this polyphonic geometry of the uh, planetary orbits because at that point in musical history composers had just begun exploring the um uh the possibilities of polyphonic musical composition in other words not just a single voice but how do a poly how do polyphonic voices work together in counterpoint with each other to create a, a much greater whole um i think that's beautiful uh the other thing that you were saying about the resonance against an unheard space uh, it is very fascinating just even on its surface that any i mean and i think this gives away the point immediately that any individual note as a frequency uh has it doesn't have it doesn't have a fixed meaning it, it's always changing its meaning depending on what modality it's coming in the context of and so I mean, in C major, an E natural is the major third, but in F major, the E, the e natural is the leading tone. And so it has a very stable quality in C major, but it has a very, um, very tense quality as a leading tone in F major. But it, within the well-tempered system as a whole, as a, as a unity, as a geometry, both of those keys exist at the same time. And it's the intersection between the keys and the fact that there's an ambiguity that notes themselves can have an ambiguity. That's that's why I think music has the has the uh, has the capacity to be the vehicle, to be the medium for these ideas that 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 they reflect from from the mind. Other questions? Can I go, Jen? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Um, I once asked our friend Lyndon uh, how it could be that Ferd Wengler could be such a genius in understanding Beethoven and so forth in his conducting and as I think I indelicately put it at the time, be such a terrible composer. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what Lynn said, but I'd like to hear what you say first. <laughs> if, you ever, if you ever thought about this, if you disagree in this question, I, I haven't listened to all of his compositions, but what I have, um, I, I, I have to say, I, I don't get it. I don't get them. I want to say that I have an open mind. Um, I don't believe that we, uh, first of all, I don't believe that we know the, the full scope of his work as a composer. Um, a, lot of, a lot of his material has actually not even been published. Actually, I'll take that back. This publishing company that published this score, this was literally just came out about a year ago. Um, it's called what is it? I, I can't Reese, see the name on that. Reese and Erler. It's based in Berlin. Um, they are they're actually undertaking a project to to publish um, a lot of of Furt Wengler's comp composed works, both his early works as a young person and also later. Um, I I am actually more intrigued than uh, than convinced because when I go back and look at a lot of his early work. He has some amazing piano fan fantasies uh, that he composed when he was an early teenager, which are very, very Bachian and very much, very, very, um, very reflective. I mean, actually he has one in the key of C minor, which starts with a something which I think would resonate with this C minor musical offering. Dum, bum, 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 bum. Um, he also wrote a lot of uh, just early studies and fugue and, and, and sonatas. Uh, 
he started by working by writing for the voice as leader and he was really trying to set poetry to music um i do know that uh he made he he didn't intend to be an all-star <laughs> world famous conductor from the beginning um and doing 3200 uh performances within the span of a 48 year career is quite a lot and he never actually, he, he expressed many, many times that he was very frustrated that he never actually got to have the, the time and the, the quiet and concentration to develop himself as the composer that he wanted to be. Um, he, there, was a, there was a time when he actually, well, this get into more detail, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm there's there's also a lot to think about in terms of the change of of style of music over time but the fact that there's an unbroken unity between bach and brahms uh and that's where furtwängler is trying to locate himself and we have to understand that there's a developing language which is what is the contemporary language of the concert hall um where the material is changing the devices that that are becoming part of the language culture of music are changing but Furt Wengler is trying to work with that to actualize what his ideal is in terms of composition um what he did do is he was very 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 strict in rejecting uh the innovations what he called 12 tone polytonal uh and uh, microtones and he said this is just novelty for its own sake this is not this is not the the organic development of the musical language because the ideas are necessitating it in the way that you would understand that ba that Beethoven developed the musical language because because his ideas needed that necessitated that he said this is just an artificial this is just novelty for its own sake although he did come he did conduct premieres of of many works of composers who were living during his time um let me just say i think there's more to discover and i'm keeping an open mind well i'll say lyndon's reply was very uh short and sweet he said he wasn't a terrible composer he was just trying to teach some people some things so maybe it was, and I'm listening to what you're saying about uh, rejecting the novelty for novelty's sake uh, in terms of trying to bring people back to developing certain ideas in an organic and a lawful fashion. I'd say one more thing. I do think that he also, uh, at his core, he was a symphonic conductor. And I really do, one thing I do hear in his in his compositions his symphony number no. two and um and other things is he's trying to exploit the 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 possibilities of the symphony orchestra to its fullest extent and i mean the symphony was a was a fairly new uh entity it you know construct construct by that time i mean the symphony orchestra as we know it today didn't hadn't really even come into into existence until the time of brahms and it was still it was still evolving so i think that's also one thing i do here okay chefs i think that's still and susan you had a question okay uh really just a point of reflection matthew wonderful presentation uh lynn is preciously valuable to us in understanding what Fritz Fengler was talking about. And what came to mind is not simply his, his own emphasis on love as fundamental. He once said at a conference, love is a fundamental characteristic of the universe. Uh, he didn't use that a lot but it, it stuck in my head and it certainly goes to the core of everything he did particularly in later years if you understand love properly from the standpoint of 
the development of human creativity. That really is the core, and it was Lynn's genius in unifying the arts and sciences from that standpoint, from the standpoint of the universality of human creativity and the development of creativity, never being static, that in a fundamental way answers the kinds of questions that arise when you try as an artist in one medium or another to think about how to compose from the standpoint of of love or the the from the standpoint of the paradoxes of the one and the many yeah i absolutely and um I think that's that we can never we can never let that that element be missing from 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 whatever we do. Um, that that's the kind of that's the sort of integrity, which I think resonated when uh, when you hear the the work of Furwengler these performances. It's that it's that it's that integrity as. Um, in the in his capacity as as in Beethoven's in Beethoven's words or in Schiller's words that all men shall become brothers and his commitment to that in awful awful times. Okay, just so people know, to raise your hand, you do it in participants. It's different than the applause button. Okay, uh, Renee. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I John. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, John. Well. Hi. On um, my view of Beethoven, uh, of Furtwängler's works is 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 somewhat similar. Um, he uh, he was searching for a mode. He was, uh, he was searching, he was exploring the orchestra, the orchestra's potentialities, especially the so-called tutti orchestra, the full orchestra. The one thing that I miss a lot in, in him is, is the small ensembles, small orchestral ensembles, which he tends to use the full orchestra, you know, the, you know everybody <laughs> playing at the same time. And, and so you, what you miss is, is, is the interplay back and forth. But he was searching for a mode. Um, but what I wanted to point out is something else in terms of what you brought up um, in one of uh, Furtwängler's criticisms about the question of rehearsing and getting something, uh, having so much rehearsal that you get every single detail right and you still don't get the whole. You don't get it right. This, by the way, was a an explicit um, criticism of another tendency in music, which I think is useful to at least bring up right now. Um, namely, you might call it the Aristotelian as opposed to the Platonic uh, side uh, of music. Um, and it was embodied, you can typify that by two, two people, I think would be useful to bring up. One is Willem Mengelberg. Willem Mengelberg was a Dutch com uh, conductor, a uh, very fine conductor actually, and very skilled, and he actually conducted the St. Matthew Passion every year for 50 years in, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Amsterdam. Amsterdam, yeah. So, but um, he, uh, he also used a lot of the same kind of things that Furt Fengler did. He used a lot of rubato. He slowed things down, it sped things up. And his orchestra, which was the Concertgebouw Orchestra, which at that point was actually the most, this was in the 1920s, was the most skilled orchestra in all of Europe, probably in all of the world, as opposed to the Berlin Orchestra, which everybody was concerned, uh, had rough edges and was, was a much scrappier orchestra. 
but it was like the Cadillac, the, the, the concerto bow was like the Cadillac of all the orchestras and uh, at the time. And what he would do is he would try to pre-program all of these rubatos. He would write them down in, in his orchestral scores, every single movement of speed up a little bit here, slow down a little bit here, do this, do this perfectly worked out. And then he had all the orchestra rehearse it. It never, although he was a good conductor, he never got to what Furtfengler did because uh, he lost what Furtfengler would uh, said very often uh, was spontaneity. That is, what is that electricity when you get up on there and when the, the, the now, that moment, that moment now, not, you know, what you've done before, or what you've done afterwards, but what you're doing now from the standpoint of what's, what's going to be in the future. That, that, that was missing in Mengelberg's uh, performance. But even more, um, the other, the, uh, another, you might call him enemy of Furtfengler was the conductor uh, Toscanini. Toscanini, uh, and he crossed swords with Toscanini quite a bit. As a matter of fact, Toscanini, uh, Furtfengler was, went to, uh, uh, was invited to the United States uh, to take over the uh, New York Philharmonic and uh, Wilhelm Mengelberg was also conducting there at the time. And then they invited him and then they, they invited also Toscanini to come over at the same time. They were sort of the, the, the oligarchs in New York were trying to figure out who was going to be the, be the top person. And uh, Toscanini won out, mostly because Furtwängler just, uh, he, he just, he couldn't get along with the orchestra uh, because he, as he said, with the orchestra, people were coming from too many different places. They all had all sorts of different ideas and he was unable to create that kind of unity. But the other problem is that, is, is that with Toscanini, is that Toscanini did not believe in the, those, what was behind the notes. He, did, he believed in what was on the, on the written page, on the printed page, and that everything that you do has to be a simple realization of what is printed, what is there. And it has to be very clear and very, uh, very explicit. Um, and he was well known. And this was at the beginning of radio when radio transmission was not too good. And so the radio transmitters really liked Toscanini because everything was very clear. But the problem was the music went the music was just simply not there. And there's a famous incident, which I wrote about a while ago, um, in where Furtwängler went to a concert where Toscanini was conducting Beethoven's Ninth. The opening has this, this figure, which is this, this sextuplet figure in the strings. It just goes da 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 and then da 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 Completely freaked out because what happened is that Toscanini had he said, wait a minute, no, that's not the way to do it. I mean, come on, you know, he's got it's supposed to be a blur. It's like it's like a beautiful, it's like in a painting. You have a certain kind of kind of, kind of blurring, a like Rembrandt idea. And so you don't just have everything explicit. But anyway, that was a big, a, a big um, um, philosophical difference and it, it was a different current in music and that's that that problems remains today but I just want to bring up one other parallel which has to do with science which is just at the same time in the 1920s and I've been looking at this more is you had this huge debate in Berlin exactly it's at where Fritz Wengler was was going, was conducting and uh, this big debate on the question of the, the atom and what what the atom act, how the atom actually works. Remember, I mean, this had, this had started in the beginning of, this, of, the, of the 20th century with, with Marie Curie's discoveries of radium and so forth. But, 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 and, but then there was, what happened is that they raged certain kinds of, when they were looking at the question of how these, how uh, the relationship of the electrons to the protons and the neutrons, they didn't even know what these things were at that point. Well, what they finally uh, realized that, that there were so many contradictions that, that 
a certain current said, wait a minute, we have to throw causality out of the window. We can't really understand what is going on. All we can do is make descriptions of what is going on. Werner Heisenberg um, were, and Niels Bohr also were very, uh, were critical in that. And there was a famous conference in 1927, Solvay conference, where basically everybody ganged up against Einstein because Einstein said no, because what these guys were saying is you really can't understand causality at all. All you can do is you can find a statistical probability of something happening. You can't really find out what the real thing is, what it really is, what, what an electron is. You can't really, you, you're not even allowed to ask that question. As, and Einstein said, and is, is uh, obviously famous for saying, wait a minute, you can't, yes, probability is fine when you're trying to figure something out as an approximation, but that's not reality. And so he got, he just, uh, at that point, he washed his hands of, the, of the, these, these, this quantum mechanics stuff and was somewhat of an outcast for the rest of his life, really, working, working along uh, similar lines, really, as Furtwängler was doing on science. These people were embattled. And I would just point out one thing, just to go back to, the, because this is an emotional question of, do you really believe that, that you're willing to fight and die for an idea? And, and what does that mean? For um, um, Mengelberg, the problem with Mengelberg came up at, that at the point at which the Nazis invaded Holland, invaded uh, the Netherlands, uh, Mengelberg did, uh, did not have the, the, uh, the strength of mind, uh, as Furtwängler did, to say, I don't want to have anything to do with these people. And he went in and he actually started working with the Nazis. And he, was, he, and he, he collaborated with them very openly and so forth, and to such an extent that after the war, he was actually kicked out of Holland by the, the, the enraged Dutch population because of what uh, uh, the fact that he had completely besmirched his uh, you know his reputation and and everything he just uh, he ended up dying in Switzerland they wouldn't even allow him back in the country because he made this com com rotten compromise with with uh, because of a moral flaw in the way he looked at music and about ideas as opposed to Furtwängler who never absolutely never would collaborate with the Nazis. He stayed in Germany. And, and again, this is all part of a whole different class that we can, we can talk about because, because the point is he was, he was uh, and during the war, he was being attacked for, for collaborating with the Nazis. And after the war, he was, he was attacked and, and pursued and hounded uh, um, very much, and in a way, in a certain sense, in a way that 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 Lyndon LaRouche was hounded uh, during his life as well, for standing up for an idea, no matter what. And um, so, um, these on what I'm pointing out is that everything we're talking about in terms of love, love also has has to do with a passion for truth, and and also a an absolute insistence. I mean, and not in a brittle way, but, but in, a very, in a very strong way that, that you never compromise yourself. You never make compromises on that underlying principle. The famous, well, there's a story which I have read about. Um, Furfangler was constantly being threatened by Goebbels and Himmler and Hitler himself with being sent to a concentration camp. And they were using him as a propaganda tool, but he refused to be used as such. And he fought bitterly. There's people who were in the, uh, in the resistance, actually the July 20th uh, movement to, uh, to, to assassinate Hitler, who said that, that Furtwängler actually knew of that plot beforehand. He knew all the people who were involved in it. And they said that the German resistance in Berlin actually would use Furtwängler's concerts as cover 
to come together and meet as, and have the cell meet as, as, the, as the German underground, the German resistance. Uh, there's a famous exchange between Hitler and Furtwängler, where Hitler was getting enraged at Furtwängler because he was refusing to be a propaganda tool in one regard or another. And he was fighting for um, like the concert master of the Berlin Philharmonic uh, when, when, uh, when, when, uh, when, uh, when Furtwängler took it over, uh, he chose as his concert master, uh, Simon Goldberg, fantastic uh, violinist, who Hitler forced to leave the country um, when he took power in 1933. And Furtwängler hated, hated him. So there was a famous exchange between Furtwängler and Hitler. And Hitler said, you know, I could send you to the, to the concentration camp any day. There's a place for you. I know exactly where you're gonna go. And Furtwängler said to Hitler's face, Right. At least I know I would be in good company. Right, right, right. Um, and, he, and he begged certain Jewish musicians to never leave. Right. Let, um, yeah, just, I, wanna, I, I just want to, one more thing that John brought up. I, I'm so happy that John brought up the Solvay conference and this fight because that's exactly what I wanted to, to get to. That's what I wanted to provoke with this. Um, this is maybe more or less well known. John gave a great presentation on this, by the way, at a, at a conference a few months ago. Um, but this is a, um, I have this ready. This is a, a wonderful quote from Albert Einstein himself, who was a classical violinist. Uh, and this is what this is what Einstein said about the path to uh, the path out of the paradoxes that have been artificially posed by the so called quantum me mechanics. This is what this is what Einstein said. Here he is. Our present rough way of applying the causal principle is quite superficial. We are like a juvenile learner at the piano, just relating one note to that which immediately precedes or follows. To an extent, this may be very well, to an extent, this may be very well when one is dealing with very simple and primitive compositions, but it will not do for an interpretation of a Bach fugue. Quantum physics has presented us with very complex processes and to meet them, we must further enlarge and refine our concept of causality. Wonderful. Um, Belinda. Hi, this is Craig. And I just wanted to encourage everyone here uh, to go back and read a, uh, an article by LaRouche, which was composed uh, around the time of the, well, preparing for what was going to be the second music manual in the 90s, but was not published until the February 10th, 2017 EIR. It's called That Which Underlines, Underlies Motivic Thorough Composition. And it's this article that precisely uh, backs up what everything Matt has been saying about the near and the far about becoming and being uh, and a platonic aesthetics as conceived uh, by Lyndon LaRouche. And I really want to encourage people to go back and read that. Some people might have missed it when it came out in 2017 because it was never published before. And it's, uh, it's just an extraordinary, uh, clear philosophical uh, piece. All right. Well, that's, um, I think that's, we're out of time. Matt, if you want to say anything else, I will just say, I will put a plug in for a few things. Um, one is we have the Thursday night chorus rehearsals uh, working on the Mises Solemnis, which has just been completely exciting and wonderful. Also our Boston chorus on Tuesday nights working on the mass in C. Everybody is welcome to join those, come in to those rehearsals on Zoom. The next class of the series will be on um, August 9th, and it will be um, Liliana Garini, our friend from Italy, doing a class on the Verdi tuning. And that will be at 2 p.m. because of the time difference. So Matt, if, you, if there's anything else you wanna say? To... 
Just thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Um, thanks for taking your time this afternoon to engage in this discussion. Uh, this is a, a subject which is very close to my heart, and I think that um, it's it's a very happy opportunity. We're going to come out of this this quarantine eventually, and I do think that the time is ripe for a for a renaissance.